circular RNA. This morning we're going to be talking about a popular article because it sets things out fairly well, the research article behind it, and then another article which summarizes research which has been done and try to draw some kind of conclusions from them. The popular article is entitled First in Vivo Function Found for Animal Circular RNA. It's available for free on the web from thescientist.com. And uh, um, uh, the subtitle is Mice Lacking the RNA, that is the circular RNA, had deregulated microRNAs in the brain, disrupted synaptic communication, and behavioral abnormalities associated with neuropsychiatric disorders. So they were able to show that this, the lack of this, and as far as they can tell, nothing else, made mice psychotic. Well, at least react like psychotic mice. Circular RNAs have attracted growing attention in recent years, but their function in living organisms has long remained a mystery. Now researchers report that one circular RNA, CDR1AS, regulates microRNA levels in the mammalian brain and that its removal results in abnormal neuronal activity and behavioral impairments in mice. The findings were published today, August 10, in Science. And it says, see uncovering functions of circular RNAs. Circular RNAs, or simply circles, are formed when one or more exons or introns are backspliced into a loop instead of a linear transcript. Uh, you may be familiar with um, exons that are joined to each other and the introns that are in between are taken out. But in this case, what happens is the back end of one joins to the front end of another, and now instead of a nice long line, you have a circle. One's thought to be the result of errors in gene expression. Where have we seen that before? Hundreds of circles are now known to be specifically expressed and are conserved across animal lines. What does that mean? That means that they probably mean something because mice have them, people have them, nematodes have them. If they were just random junk, you'd expect some different random junk to keep coming up instead of the same ones. CDR1AS, a, circle, a circular RNA that is highly expressed in the mammalian brain is one of the most one of the best characterized circles to date. When the Max Delbruck Center's uh, Nicholas Rajewski and colleagues described it in 2013, they noted the molecule's potential to act as a microRNA sponge. It has more than 60 binding sites for the microRNA MIR7, although the role of the sponging remained unclear at the time. CDR1AS is also unusual in that it is transcribed from the antisense strand of DNA and has no well-expressed linear equivalent, a feature that makes it appealing for loss of function assays using DNA editing tools such as CRISPR's CAS9. For those of you who don't know, CRISPR are, are enzymes that are very highly specific, not just for DNA, but for certain specific sites in DNA so that you can cut out exactly what you want uh, of a piece of DNA, or cut it at a, speci a specified point. This is an attractive case to study, Rajewski tells the scientist. By the way, keep in mind that name Rajewski because we're going to see it again. It allows you to manipulate the DNA and hope that what you see at the functional level is really a response to the loss of the circular RNA. In other words, you can take it out and see what happens. In the current work, Rajewski and his colleagues first took advantage of a technique they had previously developed to detect in vivo interactions between microRNAs and other molecules. 
Using mouse and human postmortem brains, the team showed that MIR7, and to a much lesser extent, another microRNA, MIR671, both bind to CDR1AS. Because microRNAs play a role in regulating messenger RNA, the researchers next looked for changes in gene expression in CDR1AS deficient animals. They found that knockout mice showed altered expression of a set of genes associated with brain activity called immediate early genes, several of which have already been identified as targets of MIR7. It's known that neuronal activity is often marked by upregulation of immediate early genes, Rajewski says. In the brains of knockout mice, it was very clear that immediate early genes as a group go up. There's more of them. That should be a good thing, right? But it isn't. What's a knockout mouse? A knockout mouse is a mouse that has had a specific area of DNA, DNA taken out by some way. Either by making it into nonsense or by simply clipping out the DNA and fusing the rest of the DNA back together. So that area has been knocked out. Consistent with this change in gene expression, the researchers found on closer inspection that mutant mice did indeed show abnormalities in neuronal activity. Among other things, single cell analyses of neurons revealed that, compared to controls, knockout mice had more than double the frequency of miniature excitatory postsynaptic currents, a sign of disrupted neurotransmission. That is, the nerves aren't transmitting properly. Finally, the team ran a suite of experiments to look for behavioral consequences of CDR1AS deficiency. Although knockout mice exhibited normal anxiety levels and no obvious memory defects, the re researchers found that the mutants perform poorly in pre-pulse inhibition experiments, which measure an ab animal's ability to suppress a startle response to an aversive stimulus, such as a sudden loud noise, if a preceding, weaker version of the stimulus has already been played as a warning. We'll get into why that is important later on. It's a mechanism preventing you from freaking out in a loud environment, Rajewski explains. It's really essential for the function of any kind of sensor motor response. Impairment in this mechanism in humans is often associated with neuropsychiatric disorders such as schizophrenia, Tourette syndrome, and obsessive compulsive disorder, hinting that at an ultimate role for CDR1 AS in, beha in behavior. Skipping over the last three paragraphs, we're going to come to the article itself, which uh, uh, cannot be. Um, uh, gotten on the net for free unless you're a faculty member somewhere. Um, Loma Linda will work fine, uh, in which case you can get it, and I did. Um, but the abstract is available online, and you can read that. Uh, it is so new that I don't actually have a page number for this. All I have is the, uh, is the uh, web address. The abstract reads, there's two parts to it. Hundreds of circular RNAs are highly abundant in mammalian brain with oftentimes, oftentimes conserved expression. Here we show that the circular RNA, CDR1AS, is massively bound by MIR7 and MIR671 in the human and mouse brain. When the CDR1AS locus was removed from the mouse genome, Knockout animals displayed impaired sensory motor gating, a deficit in the ability to filter out unnecessary information associated with neuropsychiatric disorders. One of the problems with schizophrenics is that there are so many things bombarding them that they can't concentrate on the things that are really important. Electrophysiological recordings revealed dysfunctional synaptic transmission. Expression of microRNA as MIR7 and MIR671 was specifically and post-transcriptionally misregulated in all brain regions analyzed. 
expression of immediate early genes such as FOS, a direct MIR7 target was enhanced in CDR1AS deficient brains, providing a possible molecular link to the behavioral phenotype. Our data indicate an in vivo loss of function circular RNA phenotype and suggest that interactions between circular RNAs and microRNAs are important for normal brain function. Let me unpack that just a little bit. In the brain, there are certain enzymes that are expressed at certain specific times. They're called immediate early genes. FOS is one of them. Okay. And perhaps those things are supposed to lay down certain kinds of tracks. But at a certain point, they should be suppressed. And so what you should see is a spike and then a suppression. How do you do that if you're uh, using just the standard mechanism? Well, you can't, really, because you need a high level and then you need it to come down to a low level. So what you need is something that will allow it to spike the first time, but then suppress it later. Um, so microRNA MIR7 decreases those kinds of genes. Okay. Uh, so that allows for the later suppression of them, and that's good. So circular RNA CDR1 increases the levels of microRNA MIR7, and therefore decreases the immediate early genes. So that helps to continue this suppression. Is that really important? Well, actually, yes, because if you lose CDR1AS, then you decrease the level of microRNA7, and therefore you increase the level of those early uh, genes. And it might not make much difference ordinarily, but if you know, you need to say, oh, I've heard that noise before, forget about it, and pay attention to something else. Without that, if the stimulus keeps coming, you keep paying attention to it. And you have a hard time. In the middle of a play, you notice that the walls are painted. What do the walls have to do with the play? Well, nothing. And you really should be able to tune it out, so to speak. But without that continued suppression, which is partially mediated by circular RNA, you can't do that. Or at least you can't do it well enough. Electrophysiological recordings reveal dysfunctional synaptic transmission. So this is that paragraph, or that second part of the, and, and now you can see we have expression of immediate early genes and you see, it's in deficient brains, those kept stayed up because the microRNA was suppressed because it wasn't being supported somehow by this circular RNA. And that means the circular RNA has a function in humans, or at least in mice, and presumably in humans, that actually uh, doesn't work as well if it's not there. Now, to get to the article itself, and, and this will give you some background for a circular RNA, in recent years it has been shown that animals express large numbers of single-stranded RNA molecules which are covalently closed at the 5 prime, 3 prime end, which means now they don't actually have an end, they just keep going around. All mammalian circular RNAs studied to date are consequences of back splicing, in which the spliceosome joins the three end, the three prime end of an exon with an upstream five prime end of the same or different exons from the same transcript, so that you know there isn't an end anymore. Back splicing is context dependent. It means it depends on where you are, whether it's being done or not, and circular RNAs are often tissue and developmental stage specifically expressed. This is one more way of making sure. Remember Bill Gates and his, you know, uh, DNA is uh, programming 
but at a far higher level than we have any idea. Well, this is, we're discovering one of the levels. In mammals, a few hundred circular RNAs, or maybe I should say a few hundred kinds of circular RNAs, the RNAs themselves, of course, are all over, are highly expressed in major brain areas with frequently conserved expression between human and mouse. In neurons, circular RNAs are expressed in the soma and the neurites and have the overall highest concentration at synaptosomes. Those are the places where the nerves actually transmit information from one nerve cell to another. Probably due to the absence of five prime and three prime ends, circular RNAs feature half, lives, half lifetimes ranging from hours to days or longer, and are therefore generally much more stable than linear coding or non-coding messages. See, the, the ones that are just sitting around with, no an, uh, with two ends, the body figures out that it uh, doesn't need them anymore and starts chopping them up. Whereas these things, there's no end to start chopping from. Thus, circular RNAs may carry out biological functions that are different compared to other classes of RNAs. However, their l normal functions are largely unknown. CDR1AS is a circularized, long, non-coding, um, LNC if you want to abbreviate it, RNA that is highly abundant in the mammalian brain and expressed at low levels or absent in other tissues and organs, although for some reason there's some in the spleen. Or, no, correction, there's not. That's right, it's not in the spleen. It is highly conserved across mammals and not detectable as, linear, as a linear transcript. Human CDR1AS, now don't ask me why they capitalized, I guess they just forgot, <laughs> which is mainly located in the cytoplasm is over 70 binding sites for the microRNA MIR7, which is involved in regulation of a number of genes in the brain. Binding of MIR7 to CDR1 has been shown in cell lines and consequently CDR1 has been proposed to function as a sponge for MIR7 by reducing the number of freely available MIR7 molecules so they can't get chopped up. The MIR7 binding sites are only partially complementary to MIR7, ensuring that CDR1 is not sliced by AGO2 bound to M MIR7 CDR1 AS complexes. That is to say, there is an enzyme that goes around looking for RNA that has been doubly joined perfectly. When it finds it, it cuts it up. But this is just a little bit mismatched so that that enzyme isn't triggered. Now, CDR1 also has a binding site for MIR671. This binding site, in contrast to the MIR7, has almost full complementarity to MIR671 and therefore may be used by MIR671 to mediate slicing of CDR1AS, potentially to release its MIR7 cargo. We don't know that. That's just a guess. However, the normal in vivo function of CDR1AS is unknown. Or at least uh, it wasn't known until the experiment ha t took place. We still don't know all of the function, but we do know a small part of it, or maybe a large part, who knows. Now the results, okay, points that they're going to be making. One, CDR1AS binding by MIR7 and MIR671 in the mammalian brain. So it happens, and this is how they know to identify miRNAs that bind CDR1AS in the mammalian brain, we utilize the recent finding that after RNA protein purification of the miRNA effector AGO via cross-linking and immunoprecipitation, or CLIP for short, the three prime end of the miRNA, miRNAs can be ligated to the five prime end of their RNA target sites. So you can basically stick the RNA that's kind of together, fully together, and now once they've done that, they can identify it. 
after sequencing these so-called chimeras allow unambiguous in vivo detection of microRNA target sites as well as simultaneously the identification of the individual miRNAs bound to them. So they can basically they can find well what's stuck to what? Using our computational pipeline for chimera detection, we identified and mapped tens of thousands of chimeras in recently published AGO CLIP data. So somebody had gone through and just run the experiment and then published the data, and they don't really understand all of it. But if you pour through the data that they have given you, you can find this stuff. When ranking these transcripts by the number of microRNA7 chimeras mapping to an individual transcript, the top scoring target of all transcripts in both human and mouse brains was CDR1AS. So they got interested, well, let's find out what it's doing since it's uh, binding all of these things. Only one other microRNA was highly bound to CDR1AS besides the CDR, uh, micro7, and that's microRNA671. However, in contrast to MIR7, for which we detect many distinct CDR1 binding sites, we detected only one main binding site for MIR671. Strikingly, these binding site architectures are perfectly conserved during mammalian evolution. Meaning, there must be some function. Otherwise, why would it keep the same exact sequence through evolutionary time? Now, keep in mind that if the people who are writing this are saturated in evolutionary theory and believe it implicitly. So they're looking at it and saying, well, if it's still identical from mouse to human, then mu something must have kept it identical. There must be only one form that works, because if there wasn't, if there was multiple forms that worked, well, it would have mutated into one of those multiple forms indicating that they are linked to the function of CDR1AS. Neural exp so one, it binds stuff. We can prove that, and they have a bunch of evidence for it. Um, I'm not showing you all the evidence, obviously. We're skimming through the paper. If you're interested, I would say read the paper. Um, neural expression pattern of, so where is this circular RNA found? And they did co-staining with neuromarkers, which revealed that CDR1AS was highly expressed in neurons, but not express, expressed in glial cells, such as oligodendrocytes and astrocytes, and also not expressed too many other places. And, you know, there's a bunch of stuff that it tells you how they did that, and you can read all the supporting data. CDR1AS, loss of function mutant mice, so they were able to make mice that didn't have it. They frown on doing this in humans for some reason. As CDR1AS is so efficiently circulized in human and mouse cells that it cannot be detected as a linear transcript. What that means is that it gets transcribed and immediately gets circularized. This is a perfect thing to have that happen. The most straightforward strategy to create a loss of function mouse model for this circular RNA. So you can't send something in there to cut up the circular RNA before it becomes a circle because it doesn't stay around in the non-circularized form for very long. So what you do is you just take it out of the DNA itself. It is to remove the CDR1AS locus by CRISPR-Cas9. However, this strategy could also affect transcription on the other strand and therefore complicate the interpretation. So, you know, you could have information on one side and information on the other side, and you take out the one information, you're actually taking out both ends. So th they tried to find out, is there anything else being carried by this gene that we can find? And so they say, we failed to detect in mouse brains, specific mouse brain regions or any other mouse or human tissue analyzed, any evidence for transcription of the strand opposite CDR1AS. So that part just stays in the nucleus and does whatever. We therefore proceeded and successfully removed the CDR1AS locus from the mouse genome. 
CDR1AS knockout mice were viable, fertile, and displayed no gross abnormality in bra adult brain anatomy. They looked like normal mice. Skipping over a paragraph, and then they say MIR7 and MIR671 are post-transcriptionally deregulated in um, CDR1AS knockout brains. These are the mice that don't have it anymore. So they're deregulated. Now, in one case, the, it goes up. In another case, it goes down. But the point of it is, it isn't the same as it is in normal wild-type mice. We sequenced microRNAs in four major brain regions, cerebellum, cortex, hippocampus, and olfactory bulb, where CDR1 is, AS is highly expressed. Northern blot analysis was also used to detect MIR7 in assayed tissues, figure S8. When comparing expression levels from our sequencing data in wild type and knockout animals, MIR7 was consistently and markedly downregulated, so MIR7 is much lower than usual um, and consistent. This down regulation was highly specific. It had that particular uh, MIR7 was down. And moreover, this MIR down regulation was post-transcriptional. It didn't interfere with the transcription of MIR7. It just interfered with what happened to it after it was transcribed. Contrary to MIR7, MIR6715P expression in knockout animals was upregulated in the cerebellum cortex and olfactory bulb. So the 671 actually went up. Now that's abnormal regulation, but it's in the opposite direction. Similarly to MIR7, this deregulation in KO mice was highly specific. Aside from MIR671, no other microRNA was consistently upregulated. I'm, again, I'm skipping over some stuff. Uh, I don't want to lose you in the details, um, but they're there. Uh, we analyzed CDR1AS, microRNA7, and microRNA671 levels in non-brain tissues, lung, skeletal muscle, spleen, heart, and spinal cord. So they didn't just look at the brain, they looked at other tissues. In the spleen, where CDR1AS was undetectable, but MIR7A was well expressed, and other tissues exhibiting very low expression of CDR1AS, the levels of MIR7A was not changed by the CDR1AS removal. So this is specific for brain tissue itself. Which is good, we need something to be able to differentiate brain from skeletal muscle or or a vascular wall or whatever. Um, liver, you know, all those things that are special. And we need something to di differentiate liver tissue from a gut lining or, or, you know. In other words, we actually need this kind of thing to happen in the human body in order to have all the different tissues coming from the same DNA instructions. <clears throat> The only non-brain tissue with substantially changed MIR7 was spinal cord, hmm, which sounds like brain. Yes, uh, comment here. Cord, Just a minute. Spinal cord is the central nervous system. Of course. So, of why course. so it makes sense that yeah. it would happen in the spinal cord right. and, in the, and in the brain. brain. Yeah. So, yeah. So this is specific to neural tissue, apparently. Uh, central nervous system tissue. And then they have a section on upregulation of immediate early genes, including MIR targets in CDR1 AS knockout brains. I'm not going to go into the details. There's a whole paragraph on it. It's a big paragraph, and it talks about all that kind of stuff. Uh, but the, the title pretty much gives you the idea that you know the stuff that microRNA7 normally suppresses goes up. And there's dysfunction of excitatory synaptic transmission in CDR1AS knockout mice. That is to say, 
their nerves don't function quite like they should. They're close, but there's some subtle differences. And so you can believe that maybe it makes an actual difference in what's going on. Again, I'm going to skip over the details themselves. And then, the, I think this is the final section, neuropsychiatric-like uh, alteration in the behavior of CDR1-AS knockout mice. CDR1-AS knockout mice showed normal social behavior, unaffected anxiety levels, unperturbed locomotor activity in open field tests. They ran around fine. And no significant deficits in recognition memory or exploratory behavior. They were inquisitive like normal mice. Contrary to these assays, a specific problem was noted. Pre-pulse inhibition, or they call it PPI, of the startle response test revealed a significant and strong between 30 and 50 percent difference between wild type and CDR1AS knockout males and females at all three pre-pulse intensities. You give a sound, you give a loud sound, and the, the mice that are normal will go, oh, that's another one of those sounds and kind of keep wandering around. You give, uh, so normally there's a startle response, the mouse is running around, and the mouse jumps. Okay, then, you know, if you make a little one and then a big one, they go, oh, that's one of those, and they kind of ignore it. Uh, well, apparently the knockout mice, they jump just as loud after getting warned as they did the first time. Okay, PPI is used to detect defects in the normal suppression of the startle response that occurs when a startle eliciting, sim eliciting stimulus, stimulus is preceded by a low intensity pre-stimulus, or the pre-pulse. It is a measure of sensory motor gating that is to say, you pay attention to what you want to instead of what's coming in at you, which is impaired in schizophrenia and some other psychiatric diseases in humans and used in animal models of endophenotypes related to neuropsychiatric disorders. Now, does that mean the mouse had schizophrenia? Well, the truth of the matter is they couldn't get good answers on the interviews, so they don't know. <laughs> but they did things that humans that have that problem also do, and so it's at least reasonable to suppose that it has something to do with it. And even if it isn't directly schizophrenia itself, you can say this, the mice are not normal. The impairment was evident and specific for the inhibition of the startle response. The basic response to the pulse only 120 decibels, that's a pretty loud sound, um, was similar across the genotypes and groups. So all the mice jump when you hit them with a loud noise. Therefore, the PPI deficiency is not due to differences in the response to an acoustic stimulus or due to hearing impairments. They can hear just fine. Taken together, our data provide evidence that CDR1 AS knockout animals exhibit a behavioral phenotype associated with neuropsychiatric disorders reflected in a strong sensor motor gating de deficit. So they're being very cautious about you know, exactly what it means because we don't really know. But it means something and it could have a relevance. Now the discussion, I'm going to skip over most of it because it basically repeats the same points we've made before. But I'm going to point out that their very end paragraph because it does break new ground. In this study, we focused on behavior and synaptic functions. However, we noticed that genes specific for circadian clock regulation are consistently deregulated in KO brains. So maybe they can't tell the difference between day and night without some kind of stimuli, you know, outside indication. Um, Moreover, MIR7, MIR671, the MIR200 family, and IEGs are associated with cancer, which will be important to follow up in cancer models in the future. Maybe this has something to do with cancer. So, so there, in other words, this is not stuck on just this one, uh, 
this one point. There may be other uh, there may be other uh, points that should be elucidated by further research. Now, I'm going to pull you back from that article to a more general one, and I want you to point. I want to point out that this is uh, this is just the first proof that it actually makes a behavioral difference. That it actually makes a difference in in real animals. Um, what we're trying to do now is to point out that, that this whole field is just starting to come up. And now that we know it's relevant, at least part of the time, um, we're going to pay attention to how did it get started in the first place? What do we know about it? And th this article, again, can be found on the internet. And its subtitle is, Recent research has revealed many surprises about circular RNAs from finding that they are translated in vivo to links between their expression and disease. Uh, we found out that they even existed to start with. That's a surprise. RNA comes in many sizes and shapes. Over the past few decades, researchers have characterized at least two dozen different RNA varieties beyond the textbook classics. You know the textbook classics. Ribosomal RNA, translating RNA, and then the messenger RNA that has the code for the protein you want. But there are RNAs that bind to the transcriptional RNA and help it or, or make it work less efficiently. There is, uh, there are, you know, various kinds of what they call microRNAs or long non-coding RNAs. There, there are all kinds of RNAs, and what they're saying is now we have a new kind of RNA to worry about. That's one that has been had its ends joined together and now is circular. But a type of RNA that long flew under the radar due to its designation as a molecular mishap is now taking second, uh, center stage. Where have you heard about mishaps? Hmm. Junk DNA. Junk DNA, yes. <laughs> circular RNAs or circular RNAs, uh, simply circles to many researchers are just what they sound like, nucleotides of RNA arranged in a closed loop. Much about the function of these molecules remains a mystery, but for some time at least one thing seemed clear. Unlike linear messenger RNA, circles were not translated into proteins in living organisms. We're pretty sure of that. Despite reporting the presence of one or more protein coding exons in many circular RNAs, multiple studies in the past few years failed to find evidence of the molecules associated with ribosomes in vivo. That is, you never found them you know, being translated in, at, a, at a specific time. A little over a year ago, however, Kedener and his colleagues detected something that would up end that assumption, an average sized 37 kilodalton protein encoded by a naturally occurring circular RNA in Drosophila. Along with collaborators in Germany, Kedener's group used a method known as ribosomal, ribosomal footprinting to detect RNAs being actively translated in extract from fly heads. They were able to show that these things were actually making protein. Presumably the protein is being used for something. Not only did the researchers discover more than 100 different circular RNAs, ranging from about 300 to more than 2,000 nucleotides in length, apparently associated with ribosomes in, cell, in the cells, they also identified a protein that, based on its sequence, could only have been translated from one of these circles, not from a standard linear transcript. I presume that means that it went around once before it, uh, before it uh, quit. Kadener's work was published earlier this year, back to back in molecular cell, with another group study on human and mouse cells that had simultaneously come to the same conclusion. Translation of circular RNAs can and does occur in living cells. So they don't just do what we've seen now, they actually also can translate protein. For now, neither group has any hint of the function of these proteins, they just are made, um, or of how common circular RNA translation really is, but you can imagine that it has some biological importance, Kadener notes. Notice, that is a design inference, right? 
it's being made, there must be some reason. When it comes to circular RNAs, though, such paradigm shifts are par for the course. That is, we've learned that we don't know everything. First observed in electron micrographs of eukaryotic cells taken in the 1970s, they were just doing an electron microscope, and oh, what's that? Well, it's actually using a circle, so it's circular. It's made out of RNA. Who knew? Um, circular RNAs were for decades considered post-transcriptional mistakes. Chunk RNA expressed at low levels in the cell, perhaps the results of splicing gone wrong. Generated when, you know, you got all this splicing material, sometimes it grabs the wrong thing and puts it together. Uh, generating when an exon's two ends are covalently joined together instead of two adjacent exons. But all that changed when Julius Salzman and colleagues at Stanford University set out to identify all types of RNA in human cells using an unbiased approach. One that diverged from the standard methods by including in our RNAs that lack poly A tails. You see, usually you just find all the ones by assuming they all had poly A tails and then you reproduce them and you say, well, what do we got? And then you characterize that. But if you've got something that doesn't have a poly A RNA tail, it's gonna miss that. In 2012, the team discovered thousands of circles using this method. Uh, that probably should read thousands of different kinds of circles. What's more, we reported that there were hundreds of circular RNAs that were more abundant than their cognate linear transcripts. That is, there are more circles than there are plain ones. Salzman tells the scientists, I think people were in a bit of disbelief. Well, yeah. Around the same time, other labs were finding additional evidence to contradict the view of circular RNA as merely circular cellular noise. Within the year, Jack, then at the University of North Carolina State School of, North Carolina School of Medicine, and colleagues reported that at least one of every eight genes expressed in human fibroblasts gave rise to circular RNAs. Over 10% are circle. We were frankly shocked finding even one circular RNA, Jack recalls. We thought it was a fascinating novelty. The group also found that many circular RNA sequences were highly conserved between humans and mice. Meaning from a standard evolutionary point of view that they had to have a function. And shortly afterwards, two more groups published further evidence of circular DNA's abundance in humans and mice, and additionally in nematode worms. You can find them all over. Now research on circular RNAs is exploding and the molecule's biogenesis is gradually becoming clearer. At least two proteins, muscle blind and quaking, have been, apparently the mice that have quaking absent shiver, have been linked to circle formation, which generally occurs when the cell's splicing machinery connects a downstream splice donor to an upstream splice acceptor. Instead of the usual splicing, they splice around in a circle, uh, such as joining an exon's five prime end to its own three prime end or an upstream exon's three prime end in a process known as back splicing. Recently, several, yeah, by the way, when we get done, you will see a drawing of back splicing on, on the uh, slide background. Recently, several additional mechanisms have been proposed. I uh, see making the rounds here. And some circular RNAs contain introns either instead of or in addition to exons. It's not all done with just exons spliced together. Despite a, bro despite a growing appreciation for the abundance and now translation of circular RNAs in eukaryotes, there's still very little understanding of exactly what circular RNAs do. Uh, I'm going to skip over some parts in search of a function, so they're trying to find what a function is. Again, remember this is design. It's there, it's probably doing something we ought to find out what it is, rather than it's there, it's junk, why even look for a function? 
Whether or not circular RNAs are translated, it's possible that the vast majority of circles do nothing at all. Hmm. See? Junk RNA. It's crazy to assume they're doing something just because they're there, says Nicholas Rajewski. Wait a minute. Do you remember that name? That's the guy that co-authored the article that we started with. Talk about eating one's words. An RNA researcher at the Max Lilburg Center for Molecular Medicine in Berlin who collaborated on both molecular cell papers. The null hypothesis is that they're not doing anything. And we accept the null hypothesis until proven otherwise. Well, at least for one, I guess it's been proven otherwise. He added that although thousands of circular RNAs are expressed in various tissues, few are expressed at levels that are likely to be particularly biologically relevant. It's not like there are thousands or millions of circles everywhere and they're all important, he says. Can you see the pull of the paradigm which says that this stuff is all cobbled together? And it works, but it works barely, and it's not fine-tuned, and there's not, you see? That's the paradigm, and that's the paradigm he's working under. But there are certainly reasons to believe that at least some circular RNAs are more than just molecular accidents. Well, maybe. In addition to the fact that many circular RNAs are conserved across species, again, the evolutionary argument that you don't do this twice. We're going to come back to that argument, by the way. Um, research suggests that circularization is regulated. That is to say, you say uh, the body decides how much circular RNA it needs. If circles were merely byproducts of normal splicing, their levels might correlate with levels of linear transcripts expressed from the same gene, said Sal uh, Salzman. See? Um, you would expect, if it's just, you know, some of them turn into circles, that the more of the linear ones you have, the more circles you have, and the fewer, the fewer. Um, but in 2013, her group found that different cells showed different ratios of circular to linear transcripts from the same gene. Although how the relative stability of each RNA molecule contributes to the overall balance remains to be determined. We, we have no clue as to what it does, but the fact that it's different in different cells suggests that somehow it's being made to be different, and that raises the question, is there a function? And what is it? A couple of years later, Rajewski's team, this is the one we've talked about today, published hints that circular RNAs play a role in the nervous system, showing that many circles in humans and mice are highly expressed in neural tissue, upregulated during neural, uh, neuronal dis differentiation, and enriched at synapses. So, you know, it's fascinating that he said, well, you know, they don't all have a function, even though he's finding evidence for a function. The power of the paradigm. I'm going to skip over a bunch of the rest of it. Uh, putting circles to use, they're going to talk about. Uh, as RNA researchers continue to explore circles' possible functions, multiple labs have discovered that circular RNA expression levels vary substantially with disease, leading to growing interest in how these molecules might be harness harnessed for diagnosis and treatment. Even if you don't know what it does or how it does it or if it does anything, if it's always elevated in cancer, then you can do a blood test for it and you have a blood test that will help you to diagnose cancer, or whatever. I'm going to skip over a whole bunch of other uh, applications, because right now we're more interested in how, what it actually does. But there's uh, four paragraphs that I'm going to read the uh, first and last paragraph of at the, at the end of the article that I think is even more important. For years, Circular RNAs were overlooked, not least because traditional sequencing methods were not designed to identify them. We couldn't even see them. By the way, this same kind of thing kept us from finding Legionnaire's disease 
uh, uh, bacteria for a long time because they didn't grow in standard media. You see, we tend to look where the light is best. You know, it's like a junk on the lamppost who dropped his keys over there. Well, why are you over there? Well, because the light's better. Um, one of the most commonly used transcriptome sequencing approaches, RNA sequence, often includes a selection step that picks out only RNA molecules such as linear mRNA that have poly-A tails, a post-transcriptional addition that circular RNAs lacked. That's right, you didn't know about that, but the RNA that comes out to be transcribed, oftentimes the linear RNA, oftentimes has something that goes and adds a whole bunch of adenosine to the end of the, t of the molecule. And you can select for that and you can find a lot of RNAs that you want. But, of course, if you do that, then you're going to, um, you're going to select against the circular RNA that doesn't have that poly A tail. To retain circles in a sample, researchers have to either skip this step or deliberately select for RNAs lacking poly A tails instead. You have, to, you have to start looking for the stuff that doesn't come out on your easy assay. Skipping over the middle two paragraphs. In the meantime, several researchers have pointed out that the challenges of finding circular RNAs raise a deeper question about RNA research. If these abundant molecules were all but invisible to early, earlier RNA detection methods, what other structures could be out there that are currently being overlooked? And that's the question I'll leave you with as I give you my take on this. First of all, life is much more complicated than we used to think, and judging from past experience, it's probably more complicated than we think now. Here is a whole new class of molecule that was thought not to exist, and then thought to exist but to have no function. That seems to have a function at least some of the time, and a subtle, difficult to find, but important function at that. In science, we need to be more humble about our state of knowledge. That is point number one. The history of vestigial organs and junk DNA looks like it is about to be repeated. You know, it's there, but it doesn't really do anything, so, you know, it just shows you that evolution happens. Darwinian evolution congenitally predicted and predicts minimal and random function. Design predicts pervasive function. You can see the sides lining up now. Where will you place your bets? And I want to point out that the problem is not scientific. The science underdetermines what's what the real truth is. We don't know scientifically. The the problem here is theological. Do you think that we were designed by somebody, or do you think we couldn't have been designed and therefore we expect to find haphazard stuff? That's the point. Uh, another point is that science consistently searches where the searching is easy. The drunk under the lamppost. Notice another point is notice the implicit admission that informational sequences are hard to evolve. You see, if they were easy to evolve, the human and mouse or nematode sequences that match could be written off simply as having re-evolved. But if they've stayed exactly the same over, from their perspective, millions to perhaps billion years, um, hundreds of millions of years, certainly. Uh, mouse and human, I think 150 or something like that when they're supposed to have separated. Uh, then you can't write them off if they're identical as having evolved independently. And so therefore, it must be really hard to evolve them, otherwise you can just evolve them twice. 
This raises the question of whether they were easy or easy enough to have evolved the first time. In other words, that whole model maybe needs to be junked and redone. Maybe we need a designer for the first instance as well as the second and third. In which case, of course, if you have a designer, then the designer can take the nematode one and put it in the human or uh, vice versa. Uh, I need this function and therefore I will just borrow the light switch that works so well for the house and we'll put it in the airplane. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Uh, comment over here. Do we have our, where's our mic now? Oh. Coming. Let's see which gets there first. You got two of them now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was listening for something I didn't hear. Uh, presumably, circular RNA has to open up in order to be expressed. Actually, no. Um, they found circular RNA stuck on ribosomes. In a way that suggests expression could happen or just stuck? Well. I guess, I guess you could always say, well, finding it there doesn't mean it's expressed, yeah. but we can say this. It is circular RNA. It's been found on ribosomes, and protein products from that circular RNA have been found in the cell. So either it gets on there, opens up, translates, makes the protein, and then closes back up again, or it stays circularized while it's going through. Yeah, well, you mentioned evidence for specific mechanisms to create a circle. Yes. I was listening for specific mechanisms that would create linear from circle. I don't know that we have that. Is that a blind spot? Uh, In one way of speaking, yes. It, I, I would say it this way. It's an ignorant spot. I, I, your example with the behavioral implications caught me as a neuroscientist, and I was very interested. But wondering if it were in a really important mechanism, there should be regulation for both circularizing and, if it's important, a linearizing. I didn't hear the latter part. Well, one thing to keep in mind is that the function that they proposed would not require it to be linearized because what they're proposing is that it has multiple close but not too specific binding spots for MI7, uh, MIR7. So that the MIR7 gloms onto it, another MIR7 gloms onto it. I think there are 60 sites so or something like that. This, the circular mRNA could simply be a regulator? It could, in, in this particular pay, case, it appears to be a regulator. Rather, so than, that, rather than it being expressed itself. But I thought you talked about finding sequences that indicated it was expressed. Remember there are, what, 3,000 at least kinds of different are uh, circular RNAs varying from 300 to 2,000 or oh, more. I was talking about the specific case where they showed function. Right. The specific case that they showed here does not appear to express a protein. Okay. It appears only to be right. a carrier for MIR7, a carrier that's designed to carry it but not so tightly as to allow the cell to recognize it okay, I and that. chop it up. All right. So you have to keep in mind, there are all kinds of different ones, and this is one that doesn't do the protein thing. Yeah, well, I can imagine a number of aha moments that are still ahead of us. Yes, that's a very good point. Like I say, we are speaking from, if, if you want to call it blindness, you can, but ignorance is probably a better word.
just an uneducated observation here. Uh, I think I've said this before, that there's a whole universe of waiting to be explored contained within one cell. So, you know, I can understand now how we can spend eternity thinking the thoughts of God, you know, after his thoughts, so that his thoughts can become our thoughts and we can understand a little more of how this universe operates. I agree. There's a, well, Isaac Newton said it for all of us. He's like a kid on the shore fascinated by a seashell when you have the whole ocean in front of you. And, and we're just beginning to have some glimpse of how big that ocean is. Uh, yes. Um, to speak, to mention the obvious, I suppose, it's, you know, the s evolution scientists are saying creationism is a science stopper. But you have shown here that I, the, if, Probably if there were ID people doing these studies, they would have looked into what those are and not just written them off as anomalies or junk like these people did. So t they appear to be the sh science stoppers in this case. I. I think your point is well taken. I, I would modify it slightly in, the, in that a lot of people don't believe what they say. We don't, uh, we don't know what they're really thinking. Uh, w right. Well, let me, let me explain that to you. Remember that this guy who wrote the article is the same one who was quoted as saying, well, why do we believe that these all have function? And yet, in, in his funding appeals, in his laboratory stuff, he behaves as if maybe they do have a function and we should be looking for it. Uh, it's not the guy himself. The guy actually behaves better than he believes. It is the theory that is blind and a science stopper. Well, they, they were, they were act, according to what you've presented, they were not giving it any cr credence, what they were finding. Well, they weren't doing anything about sure. it. Sure. And I think ID people or you know, creationists would have done more about that. They have, would have more open mind. Well, let me give you an illustration of why, uh, why I think this is important. I agree with you that I think that an uh, open acknowledgment that it's in there, it must have a reason, let's find out what it is, is a far better way of approaching things. But I, you see this in another area where evolution and creation influence theological, in this particular case, ethical concerns. Uh, Peter Singer is famous for saying that, you know, what really counts is the brain and the rest of it doesn't matter. And so, you know, when you get old and you don't, think so well, why at a certain point you're not really any better than a pig or a monkey or whatever, okay? Um, and uh, then his mother gets Alzheimer's disease and suddenly he doesn't behave that way. Hmm. You see, people really know better than they say they know. And so I think you need to be really, really careful about, um, I, I think the theory is defunct. Nobody actually behaves that way. Well, he, when, mi he might have really thought that, though, before well, his mother got he, Alzheimer's. It's not just a matter of thinking something that he's not saying. He's changing is, his mind. That is perhaps. true. Anybody who has recently become a parent realizes how much parenting theory uh, changes when you come to your kid. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, but, I, but what I want to say is, you see, what this illustrates is that the theory is not a good guide to life. And to me, that's a count against the theory. Just an example, but before I give it, let me note that answering questions on both sides, ID and normal evolution, uses the same tools. It's the questions they ask. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the better papers we've published uh, with about four times as much data as anything like it, and I won't go into the details, uh, turned out to be very inconvenient for the dominant f feeling on, on how a particular species evolved. But the evidence we had was extremely strong. So the reviewer said, unless you can give me a reasonable evolutionary mechanism, I do not believe your data. <laughs> That is not an uncommon position for those who don't think it through. I had somebody do the same thing for me when I proposed that the Leviticus scroll from uh, Qumran Cave 11 was, was pre-exilic. He said, the, the guy's nuts, he said he doesn't understand this, he doesn't understand that, and furthermore, if a radiocarbon date came out the way he predicted, I will not believe it. <laughs> And uh, I, I would say, to our good fortune, we had well-informed editors who recognized what was going on. The paper got published. Oh, I, I think that that's a really important point, is that, is that there are uh, what I'm calling theological problems that are interfering with science. Yes. Oh, for sure. And it is good when your editor realizes that the theological problems aren't as important as the data themselves. Uh, by, the, by the way, the same, the same kind of thing has happened in looking for tissue in uh, fossils. Because they're millions of years old, the, fossil, the tissue's long since gone, it can't possibly hang around for that long period of time. Everybody knows this, and so, you know, pay no attention to the dead smell when you break the bone. May I add one point? Our response to the, ed to the reviewer was, uh, when he challenged that way, I said, well, that's really no challenge. Evolutionary theory is so plastic, I can give you any number of explanations that will make sense evolutionary, but we have no evidence for it. <laughs> <laughs> Do, do you have another comment? No. No, okay. Well, uh, I mean, this sounds like pure science has nothing to do with theology, but you can see that the, the question of design is hovering below the surface and on occasion actually surfacing, even in what looks like just another scientific advance. The scientific advance was not expected by people who expect random stuff to happen and you know some of it's important, some of it's not, and uh, whatever. Uh, I, we are finding out about it now. I do, I do think that the question of would we find about it earlier if we had people who were more consciously uh, accepting of a design uh, paradigm uh, had been in the research pool. And it's possible that, that uh, scientific advance is being retarded by this, ah, don't worry about it, it's all junk anyway. Well, we realize that uh, our understanding of things dictate our minds and we set policies. 1979, um, MRI showed, well, if you smoke marijuana, it does not destroy your brain cells. So it's okay, go ahead and smoke. Well, two states, Oregon and what's the other one? Colorado. One, Colorado. Colorado. Yeah, you can smoke and do whatever you want to. Well, now, the well, latest- California's halfway there. I mean, yeah. uh, you get your doctor to sign, and trust me, yeah. 
anxiety, back pain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, who doesn't have anxiety in their life sometime <laughs> or other? And you know what it what it boils down to is you get it, it a doctor becomes to circular. for you. Anxiety gives back pain, back pain. You know. So, anyways, um, now they're finding that there is physiological changes when someone smokes, and it it uh, affects the neurons. You see well, now. Duh. We, Nah, really. <laughs> so even though in the brain cells are still there, but it's destroying the synapses. I'm so glad you have the axon there and the dendrites. You see, the same way, um, uh, right, that's where, the, that's where the synaptic changes take place, changes there take place when someone smokes marijuana. And we know there are so many neurotransmitters in there. So the cell is still there, yeah. but the function has changed. What's happening to all these folk who are smoking marijuana? Well, uh, one of the things that I ran into recently, and I haven't pulled it up because I can't think of a really good theological angle to, to bring it to you, because this isn't really a science class in a sense. It's a question of how science impacts faith. But I can tell you that there are cannabinoid receptors all over the place, including in the gut. Um, uh, right. that, that respond to molecules that are very similar to cannabinoids. And when you take cannabinoids, those receptors are downregulated. Uh, very much the same as there are morphine receptors. Um, but they, they actually respond to endo uh, endogenous and compounds that act like morphine, and they're called endorphins. endorphins. And, and, and when you take heroin, that gets downregulated. And what it means is that if a person has been taking pain medicine for a long time, they actually can't stand as much pain when they don't have it. And they're addicted. And in fact, dependent. they can't stand as much pain when they do have it over the long haul, which is how you get hooked on it. No, no wonder we consume 80% of all the narcotics in the world. Yeah. Narcotics? 80%. 8 zero. No. 80%. You see, yes, there are endocannabinoids also. You see, you're talking, we're, someday we're going to talk about uh, caffeine and coffee. Same way. It, it, when someone drinks coffee, the heart rate will go up. Well, it also releases the, you know, the epinephrine and uh, cortisol level go up. So rush of sugar in there, the insulin, you know, the pancreas goes to work and pumps insulin in there. So there's up and down and up and down and up and down that go on in someone's life of sugar going up, sugar going down, sugar going up. So uh, we have to be very careful <laughs> what we put into our system. We do. We do. And you have to think of not just the short-term effects, yeah, right. but the long-term effects. You know, Remember that some of those things are meant to come up, go back down, and stay down. And if we don't have the proper mechanisms to keep them down during that long plateau phase that you know, you're supposed to learn and then move on to something else, then you wind up being not able to concentrate on stuff because you just, the stimuli that happen keep bombarding you and you keep pulling you in when really, you know, okay, it's going to beat that way for a long time. What you want to know is what's going on over here. Yes. This is going to be way off topic, but maybe not. I've been struck with teaching neuroscience that uh, the anxi anxiolytic drugs, or so commonly called tranquilizers, have a very simple mechanism of function. That is, they bind to inhibitory uh, you're thinking in, about like uh, benzodiazepines and yes, stuff? Yes, right, yeah. the benzodiazepines and stuff. They bind to the specific site on inhibitory neurons, increasing inhibition. They can do so much that they're lethal. But I have yet to see any literature that identifies a endogenous regulator that binds at that same site. And that remains a mystery to me. Maybe you can tell me that it has been identified. Uh, I can't tell you that it's been identified. However, I'm a design believer, and I think there is one. I don't think. Oh, I do too. Uh, why would it be there, waiting for a drug to be designed? <laughs> yeah. Because it has a direct effect on the size of the ion channel. It simply makes it a lot easier for inhibitory ions to move in yeah. and shut things down to the point where it's a common way of committing suicide. So, so there's probably some kind of peptide or, 
or maybe a, a circular RNA of, of, of like I, seven I guess what something. I'm asking, is this a blind spot in of course medical it neuroscience, or well, is it that people have looked and can't find it? Well, Our maybe they've looked, but they haven't looked in the right places. See, that's one of the things to keep in mind is that we look where it's easy to look because the light's no, better. It, exactly, that was my point. And this is huge. Oh, yeah. This is huge because uh, of the impact of the drug itself. Oh, yeah. Or perhaps there's no money, so we don't want to look into it. See, there's no big name, there's no, no money, so Well, not yeah, no. and, and, the, and what part of the problem is that, that you have to persuade people to part with the money. You either have to persuade some rich guy or gal, or you have to persuade the government. Well, this probably isn't a factor, because if they could find the normal, they could do a lot better design of the drug they use. Oh, I agree. I agree. So uh, there should be a huge economic potential. Uh, yeah. you Although the natural one may be designed to, be, to hit there and then to break down rapidly, uh, because most of the neurotransmitters are that way, you either have to That's scarf true. them up or it keeps going, That's or true. else you have to break them in pieces and then remanufacture them. But the, yes, exactly. But the others are at least identifiable. And I'm still wondering where this one is. Uh, I think it's there. It's just a matter of us no. looking in the right place. I just wanted to make one more comment. That's why our good Lord gave us apples, not apple juice. <laughs> he gave us orange, not orange juice. Let us make our lives really simple. Now, when someone is brought to the ER, it probably does not even go to you. Someone in the blood sugar is going down, nurse gets the orange juice, three to four minutes, a right. person is sitting up talking, well, you give the same orange, and it takes an hour to two hours to be absorbed and go into, the Lord knew what he was doing. We yeah. are too smart. Yeah. Well, you know, as far as so that's concerned, one of the things that's interesting is that they, they did a study uh, first, they tried to figure out which kinds of vitamins and minerals are deficient in people who get ca lung cancer's diet. And then they thought, well, we'll just pack them all together in a little pill and give them, uh, give them to the patients, and it'll work. And they found out that when they did that, they actually got higher levels of lung cancer in the people who took the pill than vice versa. And at this point, you're going, well, what's going on? Well, because there's a lot else that's going on, how it's delivered, what it's delivered with, and so forth. And so, uh, I mean, it's all complex. And we think we know the answer, and sometimes we do, but sometimes we don't. That was the carrot study in Finland. Yeah, yeah. Right. They stopped the study, by the way. Yeah, they, they had to stop it yeah. because the more people were dying of the trick. <laughs> there was a similar study in this country. They stopped the study. See, you go to a physician convention and oral hypoglycemics, these guys are going to put f millions of dollars worth of stuff in there trying to sell it to you, you see. But no one talks about, hey, don't take all that oil. The culprit is the oil that we take in our foods that, that uh, inhibits the uh, absorption of insulin, function of insulin getting into the cell. No one talks about that because there's no money. But oral hypoglycemics, man, yes, that's what we got. We well, must. No one takes away the poison from the well. The well is poison, you see, but we're building buildings, we're building hospitals, research centers, and no one wants to clean up the problem, solution to the problem. I think there is um, interest enough in it, and I think we'll eventually get to where we're doing that kind of thing. Uh, we were designed to fit together. Anyway, so um, we'll, uh, we'll uh, come back next week. We'll have some other things to, to go after. Eventually, I want to get uh, Sabate to come here and talk about caffeine. Um, there's all kinds of stuff that, uh, where science and religion interface that I think we can profitably discuss. See you next week.